Hello everyone, uh, we will look at the protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and child safeguarding uh, today. For this, we will look at two uh, aspects. One is the risks that children could face when they access or use the child protection or other services. And second, our obligations are to protect the children. So let's reflect the risks of children what are the risks that children could face when they come to your services or other services that are provided by, for example, NGOs? You might have heard something, you might have seen it, or you might have read articles about it. Okay. Some of, unfortunately, very, very uh, typical example is the sexual exploitation. For example, an aid worker ask a child to have sex in exchange of money, in exchange of the aid, or in exchange of a different, like a packet of a cookie. Unfortunately, this happens uh, everywhere, almost in every context. And it's a huge, huge issue. Even though there is no sex, for example, it's also possible that our aid worker ask uh, a child to see the pornography. This also happened. This is also a risk that, and then the incident that we have seen, unfortunately, in many, many countries. But besides the our sexual exploitations and sexual abuse, there are other risks that children can face. For example, our, the, especially in the countries where uh, violent disciplines are accepted, it's very possible I mean, I have seen as well the uh, children who come to the uh, child-friendly space or spaces where children can, um, can enjoy are beaten by our animators or the child protection workers who are supposed to protect the children as a discipline. That's also, uh, uh, that's a very common one. And also our the children could miss their schools because uh, we organize events, we organize the consultations at school time. That's also a problem for children because they have a right for education and we are serving for their right. We are serving for them, but we are kind of depriving their opportunity for education. And also a very common ones are photos. We took, we take a lot of photos, don't we? But to our I mean, for in principle, we really need to get the approval from the children and the, uh, their caregivers when we take photos or when we use uh, photos for something else. But again, we will look at later power, but there's a power imbalance. So children and adults might just say yes, not knowing uh, that they could actually say no. And then the, uh, we have seen also our uh, a lot of now the studies available of actually how photos in the internet can put children at risk. So we need to be even more careful about how we use the photos. And this is really our, our kind of typical risks that we cause. And also information, especially you, you receive a lot of our confidential information from children and they trust you. And even if it was not intention, sometimes information can be our disclosed by mistake. And that's really our damage, the, our trust between our children and ourselves. But at more importantly, that could cause really a huge harm to children. Imagine that children, for example, said uh, to you that our, let's say that our, her father is abusing, abusing a daughter, and then it was first time for her to tell you. And if the information goes to the fathers or anyone uh, to the father, that the child could really uh, face more risks, more dangers. So the information, the confidentiality of information is extremely important, but it can be easily broken if we are not careful. So these are some of the very typical examples that we face and the are uh, but there are a lot more risks, unfortunately, if we are not careful. And protection from sexual exploitation and abuse are focusing on sexual exploitation and sexual abuse against children and against adults. 
and child safeguarding is much more bigger issue. So the photos, the information, the are violent, which are not sexual nature. We just talk about risks. The child safeguarding covers all the other issues, including sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. So, I mean, it's not important for you to remember the two differences, but it's just we need to remember that uh, there are risks that children could face when we are not careful. Even when we are careful, we could, we could cause harm. So we need to always be careful and be aware that risks that children could face because of us. So now I want you to watch video, which explains our, mainly for protection from sexual exploitation and abuse. It explains what is sexual exploitation, what is sexual abuse, and the, also your obligations as aid workers. So it takes our seven minutes. And while you watch a video, please reflect to, um, have you seen something like that in your place and what you could do as individual and what you could do or what your organization could do to protect children from sexual exploitation and sexual abuse. I hope you enjoyed the video. So I just wanted to ask you again our questions that what did you think about video? And have you seen or have you heard anything like that? And what you could do as individuals and what you your organization could do as organization to protect the children from sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, and other harms, the risks that we just talked at the beginning. So as individual, you're already starting uh, in the right things. So it's very important for you to understand the risks and be aware of the risks that children face. And the, also to understand uh, your obligations, what you are supposed to do and not supposed to do to protect the children from unintentional harms. And the, and also now, the, now what we are talking about here is our general risks and general um, um, obligations, but uh, it's also important for you to understand your organization's policy on protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and child safeguarding. And if you haven't signed the code of conduct, or if you have signed a code, of, if, if you haven't signed it, ask your organizations to give one. And if you already signed it, also it's important for you to um, to check if uh, to check the content if you understand the content of the code of conduct. And the, as organizations, the organization has obligation to make a policy, first of all, on the protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and child safeguarding, and make sure that all staff members and all, all of you understand what are, the, what are the acceptable or unacceptable behavior and what are the consequences when you, are, you breach the obligations. And also it's important that organization have a uh, reporting mechanism where the our staff or the beneficiary can report when they have problems. And then finally, the, our, it's important the organization have a system to provide support uh, to, to the victims uh, of the sexual exploitations or other, um, other violation uh, against children. The code of conduct I just mentioned is the just a document that really are stipulates the are the behavior that are ac acceptable and unacceptable behavior as a staff members or as as a person who work with these organizations, and it normally also includes the uh, what happens if you breach the code of conduct. So this is a very important document that everyone should have and everyone should sign. And they are not only just signing, it's really important that uh, everyone understand what these are, what the contents of code of conduct. Now I want to ask you a question about why sexual exploitation and sexual abuse happens. There are lots of different reasons and but our, some of the big reasons that actually root cause is the power imbalance between the beneficiaries and us, aid workers. And also our, 
they're not only having the imbalance that's the there is abuse of power that we use this power to abuse the our beneficiaries abuse the children and it happens also because the our aid workers when the aid workers are not respecting the rights of children rights of beneficiaries so let's think about power, because power is a very, very important concept to understand why sexual exploitation and abuse happens, and also the other risks happens to children. And the, also a power is important uh, concept to change, uh, to reduce the risks. So let's just think, what makes us powerful? What makes us more powerful than children? or than beneficiaries in general. Again, there are lots of different reasons. So whatever you think, I think is very right. But the big, uh, big, big uh, reason is that uh, we make decisions related to aid, like who receives services, uh, what they receive services, where they receive services, and so on. So even though I don't make or you don't make the decisions from beneficiary's eyes. You are part of the decision making uh, that's very important to, 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 to them. So that's really gives us really huge powers over the beneficiaries. And then let's think now, what makes beneficiaries powerless? Again, there are lots, lots, lots of different aspects to make them powerless. So some of the example is that uh, they do not know their rights to actually participate in, in decision making, or actually they are the ones who make decisions and they don't receive information. Their service, their lives are really depending on aid workers. It makes them really powerless. And then children especially become even more powerless because I mean among beneficiaries the or there's again big power differences among them and children are the again are even more vulnerable than adults because children has really are has even less ability to understand and participate in decision making they are depending on not only us but depending on adults within the our affected communities and that makes them even more vulnerable uh, to the uh, abuse than adults. But is power always bad? Can power be good? Can you think of some good examples of power, the positive side of power? I mean, one example is what we do. We don't work to abuse children. We work to protect the children. We, we, are, we want to use our power to protect the children, right? So power can be very positive. So make sure we can empower children by, for example, giving them information in a way that they understand and making sure you, they are participating in decision making and they know they are the ones who actually make decisions. We are serving for children, not them serving us. So it really, this kind of change can help children to be empowered, but also for us to understand that this power that, that given to us is really to, to serve for children, not to abuse. So it's very important that we still, that we kind of are, use our power in the right way and put children at the center of everything we do and think for children, if this is convenient or if this is what they want. And then they're making sure that throughout the process, we get receive feedback and keep improving the, the, the thing that we do for children based on their opinions. So really, again, I just can't uh, I think emphasize enough that children are center of the services and we serve for children. And this will really, are kind of very important things to remember when we work in, in our, in, in aid. So now we have looked at the video, we looked at power, also we talked about risks. I want to also now ask, or I want to do a bit of quiz uh, to you to check that if you understand our, what we have uh, gone through 
and also uh, look at the um, maybe our self bias of uh, your your bias toward the um, children or PSEA child safeguarding. So let's do the quiz now. Um, I'll read the statements, a few statements, and then I'll give you five seconds to answers. And the, later I will explain why or why it's true or false. So first statement is um, aid workers are prohibited to have sex with children under the age of 18, even if national law allows it. Is that true or is that false? So five, four, three, two, one, zero. So the answer is, it's true. So even if, for example, your country is allowed to have to uh, have sex with children under the age of eighteen, you are not allowed to have uh, to have sex with children under age of eighteen. We are bound by our higher ethics. So it's really important to remember. Um, second, now our second statement. You took photos of children who comes to our who comes to seek support from you. So who receive counseling or who receive support from you for your memories, and you uploaded photos to your Instagram, Facebook, or something else. And this is completely. Normal. This is not uh, a problem. It doesn't cause uh, our problem with the children. Do you think it's true or false? Five, four, three, two, one, zero. So the answer is false. It could cause problem with children. Again, we talked at the beginning. The are potential dangers of uh, our photos at the, especially on the our web in at, at the internet. So uh, we are not uh, really are supposed to take photos of children, especially the work that we do. Um, we, are, we cannot take photos of children and they are just for our personal memories or fun and then upload it to the internet. It's, uh, uh, we need to really consider how, um, how, how to really are, how to use the, ch uh, the photos. And we really think that they are their best interest uh, at the beginning, their safety first before we do any activities. The third statement. So if an adult woman offers um, sexual favor to a humanitarian workers in exchange of money, this is her own decisions and this is not an issue. This is not an sexual exploitation. Is that true or false? Five, four, three, two, one. The answer is false. It is a sexual exploitation. We are not any sexual activities with beneficiary in exchange of money, um, aid, or any other favors are in prohibited. In fact, it's not only beneficiaries, any sexual activities with anyone in exchange of money, in exchange of aid are prohibited, even if it is legal in some of the country. So uh, it's very, again, important, like the case of children, even if, for example, our buying sex is legal in, in, in the countries, it's not our uh, acceptable behavior for us. Next statement, uh, also, your donor asked you to give uh, real stories of children who are sexually abused. So you gave be because the donor is very passionate about issue and then the, uh, the donor wants to raise awareness about issues and the, uh, bring more support to your project. So you gave uh, donors um, photos of the children that you're working with and you also are names and not names or information, their testimony. And they and then you didn't give names or address or any information that can are that can tell who these children are, except for this chat the photos. So, so because you didn't use names and the are uh, other identifiable information, it won't cause any problem to children. And it is okay. Do you think it's true? or false. So five, four, three, two, one. 
the answer is false. Even though you don't use, you didn't use the uh, names, address, but you gave photos. That's the biggest information are to reveal who these children are. We really need to be careful that uh, even though sometimes we make our best intention, the information could be revealed. And this kind of situation, we really be careful uh, to really look at the any information you give could cause any harm to children. And if there is even the slightest possibility to cause harm to children, don't do that. Because there are a lot of different ways to, to raise awareness or uh, you know, uh, bring, is bring issues to attention. Their safety, children's safety are the most important. We are here to serve children. We are not here to, to, to you know, uh, uh, to exploit them. So it's really important that we put their safety at risk and then really think for every action that if it could cause harm or not. And if there's a potential risk, don't do it. So finally, um, the final statement. So I heard a rumor that one of my colleagues might be or might forced, might are engaging with sexual activity with, with a girl who come to seek support. Because it's rumor, you are not feel comfortable uh, reporting it and you started an investigation before you report. Do you think it's the right things to do so or or not? Five, four, three, two, one. The answer is actually false. It's not a, it's not a good behavior. What you need to do is just to, if you hear rumor, you just report and just tell this is rumor and you are no, not sure if it's, or if, it's re, it's, if it's true or not. Because we are not trained to investigate the cases like that. So we could really uh, put yourself and the, the children, the girl and your colleague at danger by investigating it. And then it could also, if it's a true, Maybe it could really cause more harm to children and the case can be, the, all the evidence can be disappeared and it cannot be investigated anymore. Or if it's not true, that you could maybe or create rumors even though you didn't say anything. So it really, just principle is if you hear any rumor, you just report and tell that is rumor and let the people who are trained to do investigation to investigate. And if it's just a rumor, it will be turned out to be rumor. So just report, don't investigate. So that's the end. So I just wanted to give the uh, final messages before we, we close. So first, uh, I mean, as a frontline worker, you can protect children and that's our intentions, but we could uh, cause harm to children when we are not careful. So, just we need to be aware there are always potential risks, um, even though with our best intention, we could cause harm. So for this really, please uh, just remember, please read your organization's policies on protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and child safeguarding, including a code of conduct. And make sure that what are your behavior, what are the behavior that's acceptable and not acceptable. And also be aware how you can report in case there's a problems uh, or in case you hear about sexual exploitation and abuse cases. Finally, even if your organization do not have the policies on protection from sexual exploitation and abuse and child safeguarding, it doesn't mean that you are not, uh, you're free to do whatever you want. You are still obliged to follow this general uh, principles that we you actually saw in the video and then to protect your children. So hopefully uh, it was helpful for you. And then there's a lot of resources, uh, or additional studies that you can do, um, do to really protect the children. So uh, thank you very much. Bye.